for having me. Is everything working as it should? Yes, it is. Miraculous. It's, uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to be here <clears throat> and in conversation with such uh, wonderful thinkers and makers. I'm really already inspired and uh, really excited for the next couple of interventions. Um, this should take about 24 minutes. So what you're looking at in this image is a mine. There's lots of open pit mines on Earth, just like there are lots of mines on Earth. Mining, of course, is one of the largest sources of financial investment on the planet and one of the oldest forms of value extraction embedded in the history of capitalism. This mine, however, is unique. It's unique because there's a very good chance that the desert sand drawn out from here is in your teeth, in your bones, in the cell walls of your blood, and in your DNA. It's also the reason that on May 1st, 2017, uh, May Day, this ship, the Cherry Blossom, flying under the flag of convenience of the Marshall Islands, but operated by the Royal Moroccan Phosphate Company, OCP, was impounded for 370 days at Port Elizabeth in South Africa by the Polisario Front, the socialist army of the Sarwawi Arab Democratic Republic, recognized by UN General Assembly Resolution 34 and 37 in 1979, a republic that, if you are in Morocco, the US, Israel, does not exist. But for 43% of the UN member states like Algeria, South Africa, and the larger African Union, does. I started researching this mine while finishing the manuscript for my first book, Climate and Capital in the Age of Petroleum. In that book, I used what in, in scholars in environmental media studies, environmental philosophy, and phenomenology call an elemental analytic. An elemental analytic is an orientation towards matter that focuses on the dynamics, bonds, repulsions, and scales of elemental forces. Forces like wind and water, but also the force of molecular bonds detailed on the periodic table of elements. The focus on forces that can't be easily held or studied because they don't take object form has been useful to scholars in the humanities because it allows for a research and writing ethic sensitive to what can't be easily seen in an event-based concept of violence or justice or communication. It allows for scholars such as Theo Colburn, for instance, to track PCBs across trophic levels in the Great Lakes region in North America, where I come from, through the bodies that depend on one another for nutrients and into the genetic materials responsible for cell reproduction and sex expression, and to discover what she called endocrine disruption through the depths of the trophic levels. It also allows for scholars like Nicole Starosielski in media studies to turn her attention to what she called, quote, thermal politics of various media infrastructures whose functioning as storage and transmission devices depends on the regulation and indeed the transmission of temperature. In the 1980s, the Elemental gave the feminist theorist Lucia Rigori a materialist language to describe, describe the affective currents that attach and repel subjects of desire beyond the hardened individualism of masculine and misogynistic concepts of sovereign personhood. The elemental has been important to the field of ethics too, as in the work of Emmanuel Levinas, whose writings on the radical alterity or the unknowable otherness of the other is premised on a sustained attention to the forces that bond you and I without resolving into definable properties captured in the legislative discourse of rights. And in decolonial theory, the elemental has been central to the work of Martinican poet and theorist Edouard Glissant, whose work on the poetics of relation is structured not on the stable and static grounds of conflicting ethnic difference, but on the tidal and silted terrain of what he calls chaos monde, 
or a dynamic and unpredictable interplay of oceanic, historic, and geological forces equally inflected by transatlantic slavery as by Caribbean ecologies. Also, Oksana Temofeva, who's here tonight in her recent book, Solar Politics, which I haven't read, so I can't. Maybe, it's, maybe it has nothing to do with the elemental, I don't know. Probably does. But Ty is in there, I know it. In my book, I took it upon myself to write critically with the material signature of the element in focus. It was kind of a writing exercise. That's not true, it was a dissertation. And then it was a writing exercise, write with an element. I wrote there about the rise and dominance of oil in post-1970s petroculture, as well as the hydrology of melting ice in the Arctic, the cultural meaning and cartography of ice in Greenland in particular, and finally, the force of solar on post-humanist theories of agency and sovereignty. But as I finished the manuscript for that book, I kept coming back to a story that I didn't really know how to read or pursue, but had felt and indeed tasted very literally in my mouth when doing field research in Greenland on the ice sheet. I learned that the moraine, or fine dust left in the wake of the receding ice sheet, was mineral rich and was being actively surveyed and exported by Danish and Greenlandic geologists to industrial agriculturalists in South America, where soils had long been exhausted by successive waves of fossil-fueled um, industrialization, fossil-fueled fertilization in the 20th century. The moraine, this stuff you see here, it's just ground-up rock that the recalcitrant ice sheet grinds out and yields. The moraine is the signature of a giant event in planetary history, the tipping point in Arctic ice loss, which has been in an unstoppable rate of amplification since the 1990s. But what it unearths, since what we are looking at is an unearthing, is not just rising sea levels or extreme weather, but also resource, and hence to a resource aesthetic, a way of looking at materialities and seeing prospectus in capital's calculus of productivity and plunder. The resource is valuable because geologists and agriculturalists have long needed each other's knowledge in order to optimize complex soil ecologies in the agricultural sector, meeting both the needs of populations, but also the insatiable drive to yield surplus value from the cheap gifts of the ground and the inexhaustible energy from the sun. The moraine is mineral rich. It is a cocktail of freely refined and bioavailable elements that, that industrialists otherwise spend billions to extract and process. And it is fertile because it's loaded with phosphorus. But you don't need to be a geologist to know this. The phytoplankton blooming in thicker and thicker colonies downwind of the moraine in the Arctic are forced every year into a frenzy of reproductive accumulation, mixing the mineralogical imprint of the reactive cryosphere, the frozen part of Earth, with the lively ecologies carried by oceanic current. The EU is a net importer of industrial fertilizers because there's no major deposit of affordably mined phosphate on the continent. I started building a research team to study the material and financial flows at the port of Amsterdam, because I had a sense that phosphate-rich fertilizer must come through the eye and connect this region to territories of extraction. Like granite, coal, petrochemicals, natural gas, and so many other industrial materials that gather at the terminal in the port of Amsterdam, Phosphorus comes from somewhere on Earth, and it's not coming from somewhere on Earth is the aesthetic conceit of capital's modes of standardizing its own concept of legitimation. In a very literal sense, we are placed here in this room now by the inflow of these materials, and by extension, their plundered ground. In linguistic theory, a didactic speech act is a marker of meaning's dependence on a particular context. You are here. I, I will meet you here tomorrow. That's another example, right? It doesn't make sense unless you know the particulars. Who's involved? When is tomorrow? Is it today? In environmental field theory, however, you can be placed didactically in the grammar of so many entities on a given day. Look at the walls in this room, for instance. The aroma of a stranger's pheromones next to you, 
the prehension of your own respiration in relation to somebody sitting near you, or the vibrational thrum of the speakers affixed to the ceiling. These all place you here as on a map, but materially in a field of frequencies and currents that are virtually countless. You are also placed here always and everywhere by the logistical infrastructures that translate and elsewhere into the habitus of expectation here and now. This light switch will bring light. Vegetables will arrive at market. Fiber optic transmission will send my email, and so on. Capital's diectic erasure, the sublation of a thing's ground by the tyrannical immediacy of the commodity form, is by definition underwritten by the ongoing subjugation of body and land in an elsewhere that can't be easily tracked down. The spot price of oil is as real, diectically, as the scent of wisteria blooming today, here, now. Still, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how phosphate found its way back into the EU market how the rapid rise in agricultural productivity in the fossil fuel intensive greenhouses of the Netherlands, for instance, was logistically and materially connected to this mine. But then, on March 16th of this year, the elemental specificity of the place came to Western Europe, carried by winds. Saharan minerals carried to Western Europe is not actually a unique event. Do you remember this, waking up and there was sand all over your bikes and windows? It's not actually a unique event in the meteorological record. In fact, this year's occurrence was a repetition of a trade wind shift in February. Typically, the dominant, uh, typically the dominant current carries sand for five days across the Atlantic into the Caribbean and Amazon basin, a repetition of elemental relation largely responsible for the biodiversity and uh, the biodiversity and reproductive profile of the largest forested region on, Earth, on the planet which would otherwise remain phosphorus deficient. In March of this year, this Kalama storm peaked above normal levels of particulate matter, and the reach of the current exceeded most of the EU's Copernicus monitoring records, landing as far north as northern Denmark. On March 18th, I asked my undergraduate students in environmental humanities how the billion organisms thrumming in the waters, soil, and atmosphere of Amsterdam would interpret the rapid shift in its elemental milieu. One student who had been taking notes for their weekly field notes report suggested they'd build bodies out of it, that perhaps we would see an earlier than usual bloom of elm seed and cherry blossom. Another asked if this was the kind of thing that would amplify the late spring algal blooms in the bodies of water otherwise sought out for spring swimming, and if there would be a toxic consequence to the sudden saturation in sand. We tend to think of trophic levels as hierarchical, beginning with the smallest autotrophic organisms like phytoplankton up through to the heterotrophs like us who depend entirely on the nutrient, nutrient transfer from the bottom up. But the historic concept of the trophic level developed by ecologist Raymond Lindemann in 1942 was actually, um, was actually what? Was actually the result of a paradigm shift influenced by Soviet scientist Vladim Vladimir Vernatsky's concept of the biosphere, a concept of environment defined by available energy in and as biomass, instead of the interspecies dependencies as such, and that the chain of life was forced and limited by the nutrients available in a given milieu, the determining factor or element in the energy available up through the food chain. Bottom-loading energy transfer through chemical chains strengthened by phosphorus and nitrogen is the basic science behind industrial fertilization. The Netherlands is the second largest exporter of agricultural goods on Earth despite the obvious and baffling fact that the United States, number one, is 237 times larger. This is due to the intensive use of fertilizers, and it's the primary reason, not our electricity or uh, ele heating elements, why the Dutch economy is disproportionately dependent on Russian natural gas imports. Phosphorus is just about the most banal substance on Earth. It doesn't do a lot 
It doesn't look like much or react in any spectacular way. Unlike oil, coal, or uranium, there's not a lot of potential energy stored up in phosphorus, at least not kinetic or thermal energy. Its value to the mining industry and agricultural sector is wholly other to the value of gold, copper, or bundles of wheat. And yet, the Haber-Bosch process patented by German engineers of the same name in 1910 turns atmospheric nitrogen and mined phosphate into the single most important resource for the mid-century agricultural revolution, without which the population boom and reproductive baseline of contemporary world population would be, at least under capitalism, utterly unthinkable. An explosive plot line through modernity without the spectacle of, of petrocultural combustion. Instead, a plot line focalized through soil ecology, plant life, and the double bind of supply chains, both economic and trophic. Oops. Phosphorus, what is it? It's a structuring element in organic chemistry. It provides DNA, bones, and cells with structural integrity, but also facilitates energy transfer and storage during photosynthesis. In short, phosphorus incorporates into life as form, as infrastructure, and not as content, not as information, code, or blueprint, not even as fuel. Its analog would be rebar, pulp, the materiality of a medium. This is what makes it a contingent ingredient in industrial fertilizer. It isn't that plants eat phosphorus, instead the biomass accumulation of the botanical body is, lip, excuse me, <clears throat> is limited by the presence of phosphorus in an environmental milieu. What is it? It's neither a subject nor an object. It's an elemental media of their relation. The port of Amsterdam is the second largest agri-bulk transshipment port in Europe. One way or another, the sand finds its way here by air or by sea. But where on earth is the direction of sovereign occupied ground precipitating settler colonial horror, where the dispossession of sand is an embodied relation collated at the terminal edge of bloom ecologies? The mine at Bukra in the Western Sahara is sovereign territory of the Sarawi Arab Democratic Republic and contested by the socialist Polisario front of the Sarwawi, but has been under military occupation by Morocco since ceasefire was brokered, brokered by the UN between the Moroccan army and the Polisario in 1991. The ceasefire was agreed on the condition of a referendum on Sarwawi self-determination within six months. The referendum never happened. Instead, the Moroccan army, with the economic and logistical, logistical support of the US and Israel, embarked on a refortification of the Great Sand Wall separating the Polisario Free Zone and the occupied territory, including Bukra and Leun, the largest city in the Western Sahara with over 200,000 people and the largest port from which plundered phosphate is illegally traded as well as trawled fish shipped off to international, international supply chains. Since the ceasefire in 1991, Morocco has state-sponsored waves of settlers to displace Sarwawi in their own territory, while upwards of 1,700 Sarwawi refugees fled to neighboring 170,000, I'm sorry, I'm tired, 170,000 Sarwawi refugees fled to neighboring Algeria and Mauritania. Those who remained live with minimal rights, access to health care, or secure protection against abuse, assaults, imprisonment, and murder. Following the Sarwawi protest camp at Khedem Hizig in late, 19, uh, late 2010, an insurrection largely credited by, uh, with kicking off the Arab Spring, hundreds of Sarwawi went missing or were later found in ditches with bullets in the back of their heads. After over 30 years of ceasefire, of waiting for Morocco to adhere to the International Court of Justice Declaration of Sarwawi Sovereignty over the Western Sahara in October 1975, the Polisario Front again declared active resistance against the occupation two years ago, launching rockets at border gates along the southern tip of, the, of Morocco's 2,700 kilometer sand berm annexing occupied territories. 
But that reignition of insurgency at the berm is this time conjugated by a larger strategy to recast maritime logistical space as an infrastructure of violence. This mine, like the plantation, imagines a port. And the port's international trade is where the capital's pathological, pathological drives are heavy, full of heavy contestable stuff, where, in Tiffany Lethabo King's phrasing, an abolitionist and decolonial movement would, uh, would drag liberal humanist and post-humanist discourses of freedom to the shoals, to the rocky edge just offshore. The political, at the port's interface of legal regimes with land and water, legal categories, tariffs, and labor power are knotted in media res. Leyun, Western Sahara, is in plotted elsewhere. The political economy of phosphate is first coordinated by the real abstraction of seaborne value creation and only later in the productivist drives of agrocapital. And I want to emphatically insist to, to mistake causation here would be to slip back into a wholly inadequate politics of sustainable liberalism. Organic farming, for instance, as a solution. The point here is that what happens at this mine is abstracted at the level of the financial economy well before anything is actually taken out of the ground. And this is because the medium of seawater itself doubles as an elemental current and economic currency. I mean this in a similar vein to Liam, Liam Campling and Alejandro Colas, who argue in their recent book, Capitalism and the Sea, that the long arc of capitalist modernity has always been underwritten by the virtually free gift of energy from the sea, what they call in that book, quote, protein and propulsion, unquote. But these free energetic gifts get inflected by the financial abstraction of goods moving from port to port changing hands upwards of 20 times before reaching consumers or industry, moving through entirely dissonant worlds of legal standard. Phosphate at sea renders the sovereign sands of the Sahara into financial form, freeing up stolen ground to float anonymously in the realm of exchange value. Plunder protein propulsion at the level of logistical materialities, a logistical infrastructure built on the deremption the separation of thick and lived history from the hygienic composure of capital's chemical bonds, bonds largely crafted still today at sea. So what is this material? In this talk, I've suggested that the elemental force of phosphorus tracks as an infrastructure of the body, your body, botanical bodies, phytoplankton bodies, to and through a logistical problem for capital's colonial terrorism. It's via these hinged, uh, these hinged scales of the body, territory, sovereignty, that phosphorus enters into the world and builds worlds at the same time that it compromises it. But by offshoring the refinement of phosphorus into fertilizer to manufacturers abroad, OCP has both avoided traceability of product to place of origin and paradoxically exposed its shipments to place-specific interpretations of sovereignty in the Western Sahara. At Port Elizabeth, where we began, this material is understood as the raw material of colonial subjection. Hence, in 2017, before open hostilities would commence again in the Maghreb, the Polisario declared a shift in tactics from territorial contest on land to mutiny at sea, or what the maritime historian Marcus Redeker calls maritime radicalism, quote, a series of fugitive connections over vast spaces and spans of time that precipitate revolutionary and anti-imperialist swells back in the centers of power. Unquote. Their, their tactics range, these maritime radicals, from sabotage and arson to strikes, all in a conjoined effort to break rank and subtract bodies and commodities from subjection and subjugation to the regimes of duty. Duty paid and the duty to work. Here at Port Elizabeth in 2017, the South African port returns commodity to sovereign grounds. The question then of what phosphorus is, 
depends entirely on where you are. Back to diaxis. Almost done. If you were at the port of, if you were at Port Elizabeth on the South African coast, this phosphorus is sovereign Sarwawi territory. It does not belong to OCP, Morocco, or the custom houses, customs houses of New Zealand, China, India, Chile, or the United States. If you are an underground tunnel system constructed by the Polisario on the edge of the military berm of the Western Sahara, if you are in it, phosphorus is what you eat after three months of hiding in the ground. It's the component of the desert that is materialized as the body in a militant ecological vernacular, a term I'm stealing from my good friend, Fred Carter. If you are an industrial agriculturalist, or if you are an insurance firm underwriting multinational capital investment, then phosphorus is a price inflected by risk. If you are a phytoplankton in the new mirror of Amsterdam, I hope they've joined us. Then, or phytoplankton uh, atop the Greenland ice sheet, a story I haven't actually told that much about today. Then phosphorus is a trigger in relation to autotrophic heliotropism, a lithic infrastructure in your body, magnifying your ability to convert energy from the sun into biomass. And at scale, as in the case of bloom events off coasts collecting fertilizer runoff, a primary agent forcing mass hypoxia, suffocating the multi-species entanglements drawn through the trophic web. And if you are in solidarity with those for whom Bukra grounds ongoing dispossession, displacement, and plunder, then phosphorus rounding the logistical routes of seaborne capitalism is an occasion for mutiny. Thank you. <laughs>